Good morning. It's 8.30 on Friday, February 24th. I'm Desiree Frazier. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, the Senate overhauls a House bill designed to give jurisdictions in parts of the capital city to appointed judges and prosecutors. Then, health leaders in Alabama look for alternatives to chemical in danger punishments. Plus, a look at legislative efforts to reform sexual assault laws. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Members of the Senate Judiciary A Committee are overhauling a House bill that addresses crime and a court backlog in the capital city. HB 1020, as it passed the House chamber, would create a court system of appointed judges and prosecutors for the Capitol Complex Improvement District. But Senate Judiciary A Chair Bryce Wiggins introduced a strike-all amendment when the committee met yesterday. The strike all takes out all the appointments that came over from the House bill. The strike all takes out what's known as the expanded CCID. Um, And as background, I think, and, and I need to inform the committee because it's become clear through this debate that really people don't know. And the Senate for the last two years has funded prosecutors and judges to help the city of Jackson. And those prosecutors and judges have been doing their job here at the state capitol. Wiggins' amended bill would provide more secure funding for the supplemental judges the state has put in place for the last two years. We are codifying what we have been doing as a state legislature for the last two years. Um, And we are utilizing the system and we, I should say we, I personally have spoken to the district attorney for Hines County, who I will state I think is doing a good job. I have numbers, I have data from them, and what has been shared with me is that with the assistance that has come forward from the state, to this point, the caseloads and the, the criminal cases in particular are being addressed, and it's working. During House debate on the original version of HB 1020, the bill author, Trey Lamar, was pressured by Democrats regarding the extent Jackson's delegation and city officials were consulted during the drafting process. Lamar of Senatobia admitted he had not conferred with House members from Jackson before presenting the legislation. Senate Minority Leader Derek Simmons of Greenville had some of the same questions for Wiggins as he presented his amended version. You noted at the beginning of your presentation of the bill that the Hines County delegation um, was actually here. Did you speak to the senators from the Hines County delegation about these proposed changes? I I did. I informed them. We discussed it. Um, I will let them, if should they want to, comment on that. But, yes, I did. And I was certainly glad to do it. Um, And it's no... Not that there's any secrets, but the Hines County Jackson delegation knows for the last two years that we've been funding these positions through the appropriations process. And I'll be I'll be upfront about it and say they've worked hard for their constituents to bring a safe community to Jackson. The Senate Judiciary A Committee advanced the amended bill. The chamber's delegation from Jackson says the new language is a step in the right direction, as Democrat John Horn tells our Kobe Vance. Less onerous than what the House sent us. So we're pleased in, in that regard. It still has uh, some work that needs to be done. The, uh, we'd like to see some residency requirements of uh, uh, District 7 for the special judges. We'd like to tweak the MOU language uh, between uh, the uh, police department and the Capitol Police. We'd like to really ha- include the Sheriff's Department as one of the signers of the MOU. Uh, and uh, we probably would ne- need to, to do some, some tweaking of it 
that would put less onerous language in about uh, the if there's a dispute that falls to to uh, the, the Department of Public Safety as being the um, last uh, word. The, the, having the last word on the situation, and then um, uh, some of the language as it relates to uh, putting a, a sunset on the special judges uh, that, that's important. Uh, if if we're trying to deal with back, backlog, let's deal with backlog, and once we get the backlog. Uh, disposed of, the judges need to go away. Uh, we like the fact that we're codifying what the state is already doing uh, and um, is uh, putting uh, the um, actions of the state in, in statute rather than running it through the appropriation process. The amended version of HB 1020 is now on the Senate calendar and will be taken up on the floor subject to the call of Chairman Wiggins. Democrats Sally Norwood and Hillman Frazier still think more changes could come during the rest of the legislative process. It's still working, working document. It's, you know, it's in, pro, in the process, and it still has to go and agree, be agreed upon with the House. But I think we've made, we've made some progress. The judges are no longer there. The, uh, the elected judges. We already have the, the system that we that that's basically reference is already in place. It's just building on that. And I think that uh, at the end of the day, we got a crime problem in Jackson. We all know that. And this hopefully would provide an avenue by which we could uh, work with the district attorney, uh, judges, uh, and help to get the, and public defender. I'm glad to see that ad that the public defender uh, additional money uh, and personnel made available to the public defender. The changes y'all have seen so far, do y'all think this bill has much chance if it were to go to conference um, to be able to maintain what the Senate has passed today? Well, this is a step in the right direction. Uh, part of the legislative process, uh, sitting down, looking at the issues, listening to all sides, and trying to come up with the cons- consensus. So after listening to what happened, after hearing from my constituents, and also listening to, to the uh, advocates, uh, I think that the committee chairperson and leadership decided to come up with something that we can work with and also try to improve on what was sent from the House. But like I said, this is not the final product. We're going to see what happens on the floor of the, house, of the Senate and then send it to the House and see what happens there. Chairman Wiggins says he plans to stand by the Senate's version of the bill should it go to conference. Coming up, health leaders in Alabama look for alternatives to chemical and danger punishments. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hey, this is Larry Morrissey with the Mississippi Arts Commission. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. We talk with visual artists, musicians, writers, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. on Think Radio, or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcasting app. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting. It's made possible in part by contributions from podcast listeners. Please consider making a contribution by going to the Donate Now tab at mpbonline.org. Thanks for your financial support. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Alabama has some of the strictest laws on prenatal drug use in the country. Running afoul of them can cost thousands of dollars, leave a woman with a felony record, and face the prospect of giving birth in prison. Advocates and reproductive health providers say there has got to be a better way. From the Gulf States newsroom, Maya Miller looks at alternatives for pregnant women when addiction is criminalized. Stacy Freeman wasn't pregnant when she was arrested in Etowah County, Alabama last February, but the sheriff's department believed she was, and they also thought she was using drugs, so she ended up spending nearly two days in jail accused of endangering a fetus she wasn't actually carrying. The charges were eventually dropped, but her lawyer Martin Weinberg says the damage has already been done. You're criminalizing her. For being pregnant, she's not, and people are going to look at her differently and, and see it differently, and it's a long 
long-term thing that she's going to have to deal with. Beyond the circumstances of Freeman's case, Weinberg says there are deeper questions about what exactly is being accomplished by jailing pregnant women. We've had issues of folks not being able to get to their doctor's appointments, not getting their prenatal vitamins. People develop all kinds of issues during pregnancy, and a lot of it's stress-related, and, and that adds an element to it. Freeman was arrested under an Alabama law that was created to protect children who were exposed to home meth labs. But now, under the state's personhood laws, a chemical endangerment charge allows the state to put pregnant people in jail in the name of protecting the fetus from substance abuse. Advocates say this policy is harmful and doesn't actually protect mothers and their babies. Emma Roth, a lawyer with Pregnancy Justice, says the chemical endangerment charge comes with heftier consequences than a typical drug charge. If you are a woman who are, is pregnant, or in Stacey Freeman's case, who has the capacity for pregnancy, you face this additional felony charge that carries a much more um, severe set of potential penalties post-conviction. Roth focuses mainly on pregnancy criminalization in Alabama. She says that of the 600 chemical endangerment cases in the state that pregnancy justice have examined, the organization found that Etowah County, where Freeman was arrested, was ranked first. More than 150 women there have been imprisoned. No one from Etowah County Sheriff's Department would talk to us about this story. But Roth says that arrests and hefty bonds do more harm than good. And it drives mothers to avoid seeking treatment or prenatal care out of fear that they may be arrested. So rather than respond to pregnancy and drug use through criminal or other punitive approaches, we encourage states to use public health approaches that ensure that they and their families can thrive. A program at the University of Alabama at Birmingham hopes to do just that to provide a healing space instead of a cell for pregnant women who have substance abuse disorders. It's called the Comprehensive Addiction and Pregnancy Program, or CAP. Suzanne Muir leads UAB's Family and Adolescent Services. It's a lot during pregnancy to be in active addiction. A lot of our women have complex needs, so they also have um, family issues and housing instability and food insecurities. Since its launch in 2017, CAP has helped more than 230 women, most who have been court-ordered for treatment in Jefferson County. The program connects mothers to social services, substance use treatment, and rehabilitation. It also offers access to prenatal and postpartum care, which is especially important for pregnant women who are also struggling with an addiction, because they often carry a lot of shame and feel stigmatized by doctors. We hear stories all the time when women come in about how they've been treated in healthcare settings and feeling like they were invisible, um, feeling like people were talking about them, feeling like they weren't getting equitable care. CAP allows mothers to take courses together weekly and have counseling and postpartum care up to six weeks after they give birth when they can transition to another program. Having a baby is a really big turning point when looking at health behavior. That's Honor McDaniel. She's the director of maternal and infant health initiatives for March of Dimes in Alabama. She connects CAP and other organizations together to find ways toward improving birth outcomes in the state. It's not clear if there's a direct link between getting pregnant and getting sober, but studies show that becoming pregnant can be a major motivator for mothers to seek treatment for substance use disorders. And McDaniel says that's the point of these programs. It's to catch women during that narrow window of time when they're willing to ask for help. So how do we make it as easy as possible for them to get into treatment as well as navigate the system? How do we get them the resources to do so effectively and efficiently so that they don't have to remember every little detail? The end goal is healthier moms because that means healthier babies. For the Gulf States Newsroom, I'm Maya Miller. The Gulf States Newsroom is a partnership between Mississippi Public Broadcasting and public radio stations in Alabama and Louisiana. Coming up, a look at legislative efforts to reform sexual assault statutes. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. When you look at your vehicle, think of MPB. Need to get rid of your ride? Donate it by calling 877-MPB-4-CAR. Need to have some work done on your truck? Listen to AutoCorrect Thursdays at 10, Saturdays at 11. An MPB license plate reminds you that MPB is with you wherever you go. 
Go to your county office and ask for an MPB car tag. MPB and cars, better together. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. A coalition of legislators, activists, and medical professionals want to see legislation passed that does more for victims of sexual assault. Two bills remain active that will reform some of the state's sexual assault statutes. One of those bills will require law enforcement to send rape kits to forensic labs within a certain number of days. Experts say this bill is in response to a backlog of rape kits throughout the state. A second authored by Republican Dana McLean of Columbus, which changed the definition of rape. Our Lacey Alexander asked McLean about her efforts on this issue. I'm calling it the rape bill. Basically what it does, it it redefines the definition of rape, which currently in Mississippi code is uh, intent to forcibly ravish a female of previously chaste character. So previously chased character, by Mississippi standards, what even is that? Well, there's no definition of that. I believe uh, chaste meaning not promiscuous. Um, it's just a definition that goes back decades, and uh, it's uh, not in line with the current sexual assault and sexual battery statutes. So what this would do, the, the current definition uh, would be repealed and it would be replaced with the sexual assault, sexual battery definition currently on the books. And what is that definition? I'm not sure you want me to read it. <laughs> so a lot more defined, a lot more explicit, not something that can necessarily be found a lot of loopholes in, you would say. Exactly. And like I said, it, it just is consistent with the current statute for sexual assault and sexual battery. Now, this legislative session, we've been going through a lot of controversial bills, bills that are seeing a lot of votes along party lines. However, your bill seemed to gain almost unanimous support. Why do you think all of our Mississippi lawmakers agree on this topic? Well, I think it makes sense. Um, you, you know, we have been uh, advocating against human trafficking. Uh, we've been advocating for uh, rape kits to be processed uh, speedily. And uh, so I, I think this just kind of goes along with what we're doing. Um, and it's a women's issue, uh, basically, even though uh, anyone can be raped, male or female. But uh, I, I see this as, as a women's issue. And, you know, there are so few women in the legislature. We really have to champion these issues or they just don't get talked about. There's also a House Bill 485 about rape kits that was also passed unanimously. Why this session? Is there multiple pieces of legislation on sexual assault, do you think? Uh, well, this was something that we also worked on last year, last session. Um, and also, last session uh, was my third year to drop a bill uh, regarding um, a sexual assault survivor's DNA Bill of Rights. There's a federal law, and what I wanted it to be codified in state law, which, uh, you know, when we have federal laws, uh, many times we want them also to be in state law. And that would just provide victims with information about what's going on with their rape case. Is their rape kit, has it been tested? Have they found a match? So this was something that I've been working on since my first year in 2020. Um, but last year, there was also a rape kit bill um, that was dropped that also uh, did not make it through, as, as mine did not. So what we've done is we've combined those two bills, and I worked this summer with um, some of the other uh, legislators in the Senate and in the House, and with Sandy Middleton and with the nurse Beth, and uh, we came up with this comprehensive bill that includes all of that, but also the protocols to uh, that we need to have in place regarding these kids. You know, how long can they be? You know, sit in a policeman's car. Uh, how long before it needs to be tested? Those types of, of uh, requirements. And with support this loud, do you foresee any kind of issue with getting it uh, on the governor's desk? I sure hope not, <laughs> but you never know. Um, you know, I've heard that there's some opposition to removing the spousal defense in the rape bill. I don't know why that would be the case, but, um, you know, that's the word on the street. So uh, hopefully uh, we can get both of these bills through the Senate and onto the governor's desk. It's important for victims. It's important for women in general. 
And one last question for you. It may seem obvious to most people, but just to educate our listeners, talk to us about what the spousal defense is and why you want to fight so hard to get rid of it. Well, it's a threshold def- defense. If you are actually married to the victim, uh, that's your first line of defense. Um, as we know, there's domestic violence uh, in our state. There are estranged uh, couples. Uh, I see rape as as a tool. I, I see it as uh, a way to... Uh, Put power over a victim, and I think it's important that uh, we we no longer have a marital defense, a spousal defense. Most states have repealed it; just a handful of states that that still have it on the books. And it's important that uh, we give uh, we give our victims the rights that they deserve. Thank you, Representative. Representative Dana McLean is a Republican from Columbus. This has been Mrs.